having conversation. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I look forward to the conversation, the fellowship that we have afterwards, and just engaging in conversations with you all during the course of the week, because in that, Father reveals things to me and to you all, because he shows you sometimes the heart of people. He show you as people are communicating some of the things that they're going through. And I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to have compassion for people when you know them and you've given ears to hear them and you see why they do the things they do. My wife and I were watching a, a documentary about a young lady whose world was turned upside down. She, she was one of those individuals who left her, her children in a car to go and do an interview. And in this process of leaving her child in the car, when she came out from that interview, the police had surrounded her car, put tape around her car, you know, and just hearing what she had to go through and why she did what she did, it kind of put a face to that whole situation that caused compassion to go out toward her to where if it's just a regular old person, let me tell you something, every person out there who have done something, who is impacted by their action. They're not the only one who's impacted by it. Their family is impacted by it. Their moms and dads are impacted by it. Their children, imagine being the mother of, of children and you're doing what you need to do to try to provide for those children and then to have those very children that you've sacrificed your life taken away, away from you, you see, because of a decision that you made at a moment that was a very critical critical decision. And, and the thing that, that, that I really want to bring out here today is from the conversation that I had uh, with some of you last week, realizing that if five people, if only five people showed up for this service today, all five of you brought a posse of unseen elements with you. And let me explain it. If you've had a difficult week, if you've gotten angry, if you've been taken advantage of, if you've said something or did something that you know the Father is not pleased with, or you allowed something to happen that gave place to the enemy. When you give place to the enemy, that is an unseen force that is in operation. And every action, every word that you speak, every action that you take set in motion other actions. Once you speak a word, you can't take it back. You can apologize for it. You can repent. But that word has been spoken. Once you commit an act, that act that you've committed can't be undone. And there goes a chain reaction of other actions that affect people that you had no idea that that action would affect. And you can't change it's like, it's, like try, it's like throwing a pebble in the water and the ripple. You can't stop the ripple once the pedal hits the water. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you operate in the natural realm, you are simultaneously operating in the supernatural realm. And if you're not aware of it, it doesn't excuse you from it because ignorance is no excuse. Now, ignorance doesn't mean that you are dumb or stupid. It simply means you lack knowledge in a particular area. But just because you lack knowledge doesn't negate the fact that when you speak something or you do something, there is a chain reaction to your actions and your words that you can't undo. When you are operating in the natural, unaware of the supernatural, 
It is there that you give place to these spirits. And guess what? These spirits follow you. These spirits are always around. And this is what makes Messiah's words so, so much, so much real to me. He says, when, when you even drive these spirits out, when you drive out an unclean spirit, this spirit goes through dry, arid place looking for rest. And when it cannot find rest, what does it do? It comes back. And then it goes and finds seven more spirits. Now you got eight. And you didn't even see the one. Now you got eight you can't see. And these spirits are at, they're operating by, the Bible talks about these fiery darts. These fiery darts, these thoughts that are constantly coming at you. Some of them you act on them, some of them you shake down, some of them you ignore. But there are thoughts that are constantly coming. And these thoughts are designed to cause a reaction from you. Many of you have extensive conversations in your head simply based on perception. You perceive something is a certain way and you go through this process of trying to think through a perception, trying to strategize how you're going to respond if this happens, how you're going to respond if that person says this, how you're going to respond if this happened. And psychologists have decided and, and, and research has been done that we spend over 70% of our time giving thought to stuff that never happens. We plan for it. Insurance companies are making billions, multiple billions on the idea of what if. And they sell that idea of what if so that you will be protected if the worst thing happens, which chances are most of us will spend our entire life paying insurance premiums that we'll never use. What if? The spirit realm, five people walk in this room. That could be at least multiply five times eight. Now, that's just in one area where you've given place. What about all the other areas? Spirit of anger, spirit of lust, spirit of revenge, unforgiveness, bitterness, gossip, slander, malice. All of this stuff is what the spirits operate in. So when a person is enticed, they're enticed by a spirit that says to them, if you give in to this, you will experience this kind of pleasure. And oftentimes people have gone down that road and have been sorely disappointed because they were lied to, they were deceived. <laughs> the spirit ram is always at work, both in darkness and in light. And there is the voice of Jehovah that is speaking through all of these other voices that you can't see, but you perceive, and even at some times you can hear. This is why we need spiritual gifts. And that's what we're going to continue on today because we're going to be dealing with, we talked a little bit about the word of wisdom last week. And we're going to pick up on the word of knowledge this week. The spirit of wisdom, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, working, workers of miracles. And I'm hoping to get through at least four of these today. Prophecy, discernment, tongues, and interpretations of tongues. And we're going to be taking a fresh new look 
at this whole idea of spiritual gifts, which are vital for the believer, for one simple fact. Because we are dealing with spirits that we can't see, the only way we're going to be able to effectively deal with spirits that we can't see is by the spirit of Jehovah. As spiritual beings at war with the spiritual enemy and unclean spirits, we must fight a spiritual fight. Our sight is useless for the most part because our enemy cannot be seen with the naked eye. Our enemy is non is carnal or non-human and carnal. Spiritual gifts are so vital for the believer, whereas you cannot see or successfully operate or navigate in the spirit realm or live out your spiritual life with any degree of success. You can't fight the good fight, ladies and gentlemen, without spiritual gifts. Without the spiritual gifts, we're left to rely on our developed carnal gifts, our training, and our education. We dealt last week, again, with the gift of wisdom. It is the first one mentioned in the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it is important that before you actually get to the spiritual gifts that are power, like as Yeshua said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Before you get to the supernatural manifestations of, of laying hands on the sick or healing or prophecy or miracles, it's important that we understand wisdom, that we understand knowledge, the, the, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge and faith. Wisdom, as we Noted last week and gave you some passages of scripture, and I encourage you to go back and check those out. The gift to offer good advice, solid counsel, and special insight as it relates to Yah's will and work as it pertains in living life and making disciples. Paul spent an entire chapter on wisdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but it's easy to read over and not see that that entire chapter deals with the wisdom of Jehovah in the midst of people who are operating in the supernatural. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 8 for one is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom. And so we noted that wisdom supersedes all gifts. And then in Proverbs 9 and verse 10, it says the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. And then the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now it's interesting here in the King James it has the word holy in, in a small um, H. In many of the other versions it has the knowledge of the holy one. It talks about the holy one as if the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of Jehovah is understanding. And that is a, a typical translation of that particular verse, but it could also be translated as the knowledge of holy, the holy things or the knowledge of the holy. One of the things that the priests and the prophets were responsible for teaching the children of Israel was the difference between that which was holy and that which was profane. That which was holy and that which is profane. You see, in order for us to come in the presence of a holy Elohim, we have to be holy. That means that if I'm unclean, if, 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 if there's some profaneness in me, if there's something in me that it is not right, and I attempt to enter into the physical presence of Jehovah, as we have seen from Old Testament passages, individuals who have tried to enter into the presence of the Almighty in an unholy way was met with un unfortunate circumstances. Now today, we don't have that kind of environmental access to where there is a temple, there's an ark of the covenant in the tabernacle, where individuals went in. We even noted that Aaron's sons who offered strange fire died on the spot. You see. And so when it comes down to 
holy, the Proverbs says, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding, as some other versions would say, the knowledge of the holy one. But I believe what the Proverbs is trying to communicate to us is that in order for you to have, in order for you to understand, to have understanding, you have to have the knowledge of the holy. You have to be able to distinguish between the holy and the unholy, the holy and the profane. But then take it to another level, the clean and the unclean. The clean and the unclean. The world today, especially the religious world, very few people even make a distinction between clean and unclean. Whereas the New Testament scripture, Paul writes and says to us that, listen, we are to come out from among them and be separate. The word holy is, is really to be set apart, to, to be sanctified, you see, to be set apart from, or we are the set apart ones, which means that we are supposed to be holy ones. We've been called to be holy as our father is holy. And in order for us to be holy like our father is holy, we have to have the knowledge of that which is holy and begin be able to distinguish that which is holy from that which is profane. In order for us to do that, it requires some serious discipline. It really does. Because the root word of profanity is what? Profane. When we use profanity, that is words being used in a profane manner. How often do we use profanity? You see. And so we need to learn how to discipline our tongue. But where does profanity come from? Our thoughts. How many times have you been in a conversation and you start thinking of profane words to speak, to express your dislike for what you're hearing, or to communicate strongly to someone your dislike? And sometimes we think that the stronger the word is, the more it communicates our distaste or dislike for something, not realizing that at that very moment we just went into a profane realm. So we have to know, we have to have the knowledge of holy or the understanding comes from the knowledge of the holy is understanding. In Isaiah 11, we looked and we noted that the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of, of the knowledge or the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. And this has come to be known as the sevenfold spirit. In James, we, we looked that there are two types of wisdom, wisdom from above and the earthly wisdom. You see, sisters who are trying to get a husband, the wisdom of the world says that for me to get a husband, I need to give myself. No man is going to marry a woman before he actually have intercourse with her. See, that's the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world says that I have to use what I got to get what I want. And as a result, you end up with something you didn't want. The wisdom of the world is sensual. The wisdom of the world is devilish. <laughs> and then he makes the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from above. And we looked at that last week. Again, let me read it. This wisdom descend not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. You'll notice things are getting more and more sensual. Dresses and skirts are getting shorter. Shorts are getting shorter. Bikinis are getting more invisible. 
And it's amazing how women wear bikinis thinking they got clothes on. I'm really. I was at the gas station the other, I, some of you heard me, I was at the gas station. And, and I'm just pumping my car. And, and obviously, uh, there, there's a car behind me and there's a car in the other lane. And the woman in the other car, the woman in one car got out and looked like she may have just come from the beach or just come from the pool. She had on a bikini. And I looked. You know, and it's not like I'm looking like I'm perverted. I'm just looking. It's, it's strange seeing a woman in the gas station with a bikini on. And she saw me looking. And you know, she, she went and she, she, she pulled some clothes out and put the clothes on. And I guess the guy next, next behind me must have been with her because she's looking at him like, you know, he's looking at me. <laughs> it's like, woman, you're naked at the gas station. But see, the idea, and get this, it's okay to wear a bikini on the beach. But it's not okay to wear a bikini on the streets. See, that's the wisdom of the world. So now you got to cover up. Why you, got, why you covering up? You've probably been naked all day long but because of where they are. You, you see, something's wrong with that thinking. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. I want to get into the knowledge. Knowledge, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. The gift to understand great truths about Yah's word and to make them relevant to specific situations. Truth that is unknown by natural means. Personal information revealed by the Spirit. In one of the PowerPoints that I have, you, well, let me not get ahead of myself. The word of knowledge is utilized throughout the Bible. And what we just saw in, first, in, in Proverbs, um, Proverbs, what was it, 9, 9, 10, is, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. We're going to look at both the Greek and the Hebrew on this word so that you kind of get an idea of, of where this knowledge is going. The word here is gnosis, and here are some of the places because in the New Testament, you, you are subject to the Greek word that is used for the English word that is there because theologians concluded that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. And those who sat at the feet of theologians bought the doctrine of the theologians, just as those who sat at the feet of the Pharisees bought the doctrine of the Pharisees. And those who sat at the, seat of the, at the feet of the Sadducees bought the doctrine of the Sadducees. And those who supported Herod bought the doctrine of Herod. And Yeshua says, beware of all of these different doctrines. The same beware that Yeshua gave over almost 2,000 years ago, it still applies today. Beware of the doctrines of the theologians. I found it fascinating that being in five, over five denominations and being ordained in several of them, that each of them had their own theologians and their own theological view of the same book called the Bible. It fascinated me even more dumbfoundedly to find that you have PhDs in one denomination who would disagree with PhDs from another denomination, and in some cases, PhDs in the same denomination in disagreement with one another. All utilizing their Greek and their Hebrew and all of their tools of interpretation. And so all of these passages, Luke 1, 76 through 79, John 4, 16 through 19, Matthew uh, 12, th 23 through 32, Luke 6, 7 through 16, Ephesians 3, 18 through 19, John 7, 16 through 17, and 17, 3, all deal with the word of knowledge. The word here is gnosis from um, the Greek 
1097, meaning to know or the act. Knowing or the act. By implication, knowledge is a science. Or knowledge and science have a tendency because some knowledge comes from scientific research. The words that are used for interpreting scripture, hermeneutics, which we're going to see here in a moment, is the art and science of interpretation. Because the scripture is approached theologically from a scientific perspective. The fear of Jehovah, again, is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. In Isaiah, again, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. The word knowledge here is from the Hebrew dot. And this word knowledge has to do with cunning or to be to have knowledge or ignorance and unawares wittingly it comes from the word yada a primitive root to know and this properly to ascertain by seeing used in a great variety of senses figuratively literally euphemistically inferentially <laughs> all of these big words including observation. You learn people by watching them. Caring. Recognition. Causatively. Instruction. That's one way to gain knowledge. Designation. Punishment. It's amazing how punishment, I mean, think about this. You miss a day at work without an excuse. You miss another day at work, and they give you a warning. You miss another day, and they give you time off to think about the days that you've missed. <laughs> now, the reason why they want you there is because there's work for you to do. For them to give you time off means you're not doing there. You're not doing the work they have you there to do. And the idea of doing this punishment, this discipline, is to teach you something. If you keep on acting like this, you will not have a job. So you better get it. <laughs> punishment is a means of discipline. Discipline is a means of getting understanding or knowledge to an individual in a way that communicating to them in a logical manner, don't get. Some people you can tell them, and they get it. Some people you have to tell them over and over and over. Some people you have to show them. Some people just don't get it at all. Don't even want to get it. And you have to be able to discern those people, lest you, instead of shaking the dust off your feet and moving on, Waste valuable time, get worn out. Now you're looking for some place to take a nap because they've worn you out. Too many of you allow people who have no intent whatsoever of receiving anything from you to begin with wear you down and wear you out. To acknowledge, acquaintance, to advise, answer, appoint, assuredly be aware unawares, cannot, certainly, all of these words, and then instruct. All of these words is associated with knowledge. Jehovah's knowledge is said to be omniscient. He knows all things. Now, here's where the gift of knowledge is vital. I'm telling you, it is extremely vital but it only comes from Jehovah. You see, the Bible says that we are to know no man by the flesh. Well, if I don't know you by the flesh, how am I going to know you? 
You see, the, the Almighty knows every one of you in this room. Thus, Psalms 139. I want to show you some practical because when it comes down to operating in the supernatural, the supernatural realm is as practical as the natural realm. I mean extremely practical. But here's where our challenge, our problem, if I, if I may add, is that we exercise our natural abilities and we don't exercise as much our spiritual capability. So we walk by sight. We've been trained to walk by sight from the time we were little. Our sight has been what has guided us to this point. And many of us who have come to this point realize that our sight has been deceptive. We have been deceived by our sight. We saw a hunk, but it was a hunk of a devil. Do you understand what I'm saying? We saw a honey, but she wasn't sweet. We've seen things. And then, you know, boys bring their little girlfriends home, and mama and dad is discerning. You know, it's like, let me tell you something, folks. Can I just tell you something? Let me tell you something. Some things you don't need discernment of. Ask yourself, what would cause, what type of mentality, what type of mentality would cause someone to put tattoos on their face? What, what would cause somebody to put a tattoo on their eye? What would cause somebody to put big old Holes in their lobes. Spears in their tongue. What, what's going on in the mind that convinces somebody that's all right? See, because what you're dealing with is a mental issue. You're dealing with a mindset that says, that's all right, and that, that mindset is usually rooted and grounded in rebellion. So you can see, even though the person may be a nice person, the fact that they have decided that they're going to mark themselves up is saying, I'm going to go against the norm. It's an outward expression that I'm not normal. You better get the memo. Because when you got a person who's got a, you know, neck tattoos, arm tattoos, body tattoos, what do they call that tattoo at the small of the back? Tramp tattoos. I mean, to the think they call them tramp tattoos and respectable women going to the tattoo artist Say, hey, I'm respectable, but give me a tramp stamp. See, something's wrong. Something's going on up here. And the root of it is rebellion. So now you engage in this person that you don't see. The, you, you, you're not discerning these physical Outward signs. There are outward signs that are screaming. I'm not normal. Well, I don't care. I'm not. That doesn't, you know, hey, <laughs> yeah, don't, that don't, don't bother me. I got one too, see? Yeah. You got a little, little boy's tattoo. You know, I got a big girl's tattoo. You got that little thing on your arm. Let me show you something. So what are you dealing with? You're dealing with the mindset. Now, what does the enemy work at? So, you know, you're judging them because they have a tattoo? No. I'm not judging them because I'm having a tattoo. The fact that they got a tattoo tells me something about them. 
The fact that they got these piercings, tell me something. What does it say? It says that there is subtle rebellion. And there's just flat out rebellion. There's some, there, there are levels of rebellion. And outward signs can tell you what level of rebellion a person is at unless they are repented. Because if you got one and then you go get another one and then you go get another one and then you go get another one, what you see is the stage of rebellion that are climbing higher and higher and higher. Say, so brother, how do you get that from this? Well, one, people's actions can tell you things about them if you pay attention. Just watch. They'll tell you stuff. You start seeing little stuff. You can play it off if you want to. You can discount it if you want to. But once you get full engaged in it and them demons start coming out and you start seeing the things that you couldn't see before because they smile pretty, because they was cute, because they was hunky. And I mean, you know, hunk. Not calling nobody no hunky now. Don't, don't be going out here saying, Bailey, calling people hunkies. <laughs> got to correct some stuff. See, Spirit said, you better correct that. <laughs> All right, I got you. <laughs> <clears throat> Psalms 139, are you there? Look at this. Jehovah, thou hast searched me and known me. Is there anyone in this room that Jehovah don't know? Now, just because you don't know him, don't mean he don't know him. You see? And he will show you stuff you don't know if you got eyes to see. If you're walking by sight, you won't see this. You won't see it until it manifests. You see, there are things that are lurking within us that hasn't manifest yet, namely spiritual gifts. It's not that they're, that they're not there, but there are other stuff in us that hasn't manifest and circumstances will bring certain stuff out. You see, this woman who left her son, who left her, her children in the car, felt that this job was going to change their life. She had someone who was supposed to watch her children. She went to their home and they were gone. How do you call the, the job and say, I can't do the interview today? You scratched off. So now a decision has to be made. And even though the decision may have been for the right reason, it was the wrong decision. There is a way that seems right to man. She was thinking that if I get this job, it's going to change everything, not thinking that this decision is going to send me to jail. You see, there are decisions that we make that are based on circumstance instead of trust. Well, you know, he's the only one looking at me. He's a prospect. She's a prospect. No one else is giving me the time of day. Maybe, maybe I can tell them about Jehovah. Maybe I can invite them to service. Maybe Now you got to work your magic. And that's exactly what it is, witchcraft. Because the moment you decide that you might be able to change this person to become what you want that person to become, is you working the change. That's a controlling, manipulating spirit. 
And even if you do get the change, it's not a change that comes from him, which means it's not sustainable. But that's the way the mind works. See? That's worldly wisdom. He says, Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understands my thoughts afar off. For there is not a word or verse. Thou compass my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Now let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Imagine you're, meet, you're, you're meeting a stranger. For the first time, it's a stranger to you, but it's not a stranger to Jehovah. Jehovah can tell, Jehovah can give you the rundown on every person you meet, every last one of them. He can show you their heart. He can show you their motives. He can show you their intent. He can show you what they're after. But you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. And how often do we inquire of Jehovah before we let our emotions loose? You see, when Jehovah says, acknowledge me in all, he didn't mean in some. No, you need to acknowledge me. But I got this. Oh, yeah, you got it. You just don't know what you got. I'm trying to save your behind. I'm trying to help you. See, you look at how you might look in his arms or in her arms. You look at what others might say because look at what you got. So, now come to scripture. Well, he can work it out to my good. Don't tempt him. Don't test him. Not like that. Especially if he's already told you, <laughs> listen, this one's going to need a whole lot of work. Are you sure you up to the task? So you need to step back and let me work on this a while. <laughs> now you just do my will. See, see the, the, the word of knowledge and the gift of wisdom is supposed to be operational when you're hunting for a mate. Not just when you're out there doing ministry, because in essence, that's ministry. Everything you are, and when we get to minister, those of you who are taking leadership next week, th this coming Thursday, those of you who aren't, you're missing a lot. The last area on the list that we're working on now is minister. And let me tell you something, minister is a very, very, very high calling. Folks got the idea of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. You see, we've all been called to minister to him. Every one of you have been called to be the priest of the temple which the Holy Spirit dwells. That is the, I'm telling you, how you relate in your relationship with the Almighty and how you relate to the relationship with the Almighty and your body is the highest calling because you don't let somebody defile this temple. You don't defile it. Jehovah says, whoever defiled the temple, him will I destroy, I will destroy him. And yet, because we don't recognize that our body is the temple, we don't give our body and the faculty of the member of this body the, 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 the respect, the acknowledgement, the value in which he see it. We're more concerned about what others see than what he sees. We're more concerned about trying to impress others by dressing this thing up to look attractive, to attract other people. But does it attract him? See, that perfume 
that aphrodisiac perfume that is supposed to make men knees knock and women tremble stink in his nostrils. The perfume that he is drawn to is a smell of righteousness and holiness. One who walks in obedience to his word, that's the fragrance that he's trying to smell. Hallelujah, somebody. Oh, holiness? And I ain't talking about, you know, I ain't. Um, I'm not talking about religious holiness. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about carrying yourself as one who truly recognizes that you are the temple of the Almighty. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's going to affect how you see yourself. It's going to affect how you talk. It's going to affect how you carry, how you conduct yourself, how you relate to other people, and how you allow people to relate to you. People who don't respect you and your temple don't deserve your time or your space. If you're letting people in your space that is disrespecting you and your temple, then you get what you deserve. The psalmist goes through great detail in this entire chapter or in this entire psalm to let us know that there is nothing in the earth that is hidden from the eye of the Almighty. Now imagine, Yeshua says, I no longer call you servant, I call you friends. Imagine Jehovah being your best friend. Imagine this. Your best friend is the Almighty himself who knows all things and have all knowledge and have the skinny on everybody. See? So now you go to inquire of him <laughs> about this and about that. You're not getting secondhand information. You're not getting what if information. You're not getting Wikipedia. <laughs> You're getting the knowledge of the Almighty who is giving you the insight that if heeded is going to protect and preserve you from all manner of potential evil. So, he goes on in verse 5. Or oh, verse 4. For there is not a word in my tongue that, lo, O Jehovah, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I Flee from your presence. If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hide not from thee. But the night shineth as the day, the darkness as, and, the, and the light are both alike to thee. <laughs> the darkness and the light are the same to him. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. 
Now, what, what the psalmist is saying is, listen, you know, I realize, because he, he says in another place, you know, I was born in sin. I was born in darkness. You see, in Jehovah, there is no darkness. He says, even when I was being formed, and though I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, in the midst of you form, in the midst of me being formed, you knew me. And yet, my substance was not hid. Verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, all my numbers, all my members were written, which is continuance were fashioned, which in continuance were fashioned. When as yet, there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O L. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked. Eloi, depart from me, therefore, you bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Jehovah, that hate thee? And am I not grieved? with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O L, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now the psalmist is saying to us that there is absolutely nothing in anyone that he, the father, doesn't know. Now imagine, you inquire of him about me. He'll, he'll, if you can handle it, here's what I do know about Jehovah. Is that he's, he's not one who exposes. Unless he can't get to you. See, he says, listen, you better... You better Expose yourself because you don't want me to do it. You better come into the light so that everything that you've done is clearly seen and people will know, you know, I knew him. If, if he's walking in the light and listen, you know, one of the reasons why I don't wear it as, a, as some kind of badge to sit up here and tell you all the dirty laundry that I've, that I've done and occurred in my life. That's the testimony. It's a testimony of where the father has brought me from. You see, one of the things that I had to deal with when I first began to contemplate this idea of ministry is all the wrong. And sure enough, the moment you start talking about you're called of God, every demon spirit and every person who have operated in them demon spirits when you were operating in them demon spirits show up. They got front row seats in the church at your trial sermon. I come to see this for myself because I know Bailey. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? I believe this when I, hear, when I see it. I got to see this for myself. I don't, nope, 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 nope. Where you at? And I've had people show up. Says, man, I know this is the work of God. Now the point is, is that the Father knows each and every one of us. He knows every one of us by name. He knows everything that you've done, every secret thing, every hidden thing. He even knows the stuff you're contemplating and haven't done yet. And what he'll do is he'll send somebody across your path, just as I prayed earlier. There's people who've made some plans to do some stuff this evening. And the Father is saying, you know, he's trying to say to There is every action is a chain of reaction. Every action is a chain of reaction. It's a chain reaction. There will be things that will occur from everything you say and everything you did or do. So when it comes down to the spirit of knowledge, 
One of the ways that the Father operate in the spirit of knowledge for us most of the time is even in our personal life. Just as the psalmist wrote, search me. You see, the Father see the things in you that is going to hinder you down the road. He see, the, he see the things in you that is going to draw you into some traps that the enemy has laid out for you a few weeks from now. He knows the circumstance that is going to go down long before it comes. Long before it comes. And the Father, by his Spirit, desires to show us things that are far off. You see, if we've got a child that is contemplating doing some things and we are in tune with the Father, he'll show it to us. If we've got a husband, a wife, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, jobs, Business. He'll give you the inside scoop if you're really in tune. One of the works of the Spirit is to show us things to come. And there is nothing that occurs in the earth except he first reveal it to his servants, the prophets. And all of you, though you may not walk in the office of prophet, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our lives is he will give us the ability to prophesy. That means that what I'm about to speak, I've heard him speak to me. So what does it mean? That means that when the spirit of Jehovah has been given to me, I now have the ability to hear from heaven. And if I have the ability to hear from heaven, Heaven will speak to me when I inquire of heaven as to what's going on in the midst of me, what's happening with the people concerning me, what's happening in my life, and what is coming down the road for me to be prepared for. So when the people decided that they were going to go up to battle, what did they do? Those who were wise went in the presence of, the, of Jehovah and said, Jehovah, should I go out? Should I go fight this battle? Am I going to win? He'll show you. But if you don't exercise this ability, you will walk blindly by sight when even wisdom is crying in the county city square. Don't go! Oh, no, nobody's going to talk to me like that. Don't go! <laughs> Yeshua operated in this gift throughout his ministry. And Yeshua, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore, think ye evil of your hearts. The gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom, and the word of knowledge work hand in hand. Matter of fact, the thing that I need to let you know today is that the Holy Spirit works the gift of wisdom. The Holy Spirit works the gift of knowledge. The Holy Spirit works the gift of prophecy. The Holy Spirit works faith. The Holy Spirit works miracles. The Holy Spirit works discernment. The Holy Spirit works tongues. The Holy Spirit works interpretation of tongues. The Holy Spirit is working all of this, and this Holy Spirit you claim to have. So if you claim to have this Holy Spirit that works all of this, then the question is, do you have access to all of this? That's the question. Now, I know how stuff has been interpreted. I know how sermons have been preached. 
but it is the self same spirit that is working this gift, this gift, this gift, this gift, this gift, and this Holy Spirit is not in you in part if he's in you at all. The Holy Spirit is at work. Now, here's where the line comes in. The word of knowledge is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Knowledge is information that you've been fed, that you've been given. If you've been given knowledge that you only have a gift of the Spirit, then guess what you're going to operate in? You're going to operate in the knowledge that you have been given by people. And you'll only exercise that ability that some survey said you have this gift. You have that gift. Listen, the Father doesn't give you a gift of the Spirit. He gives you the gift of the Spirit. It is the gift of the Spirit that manifests all of these. So what you need is new knowledge. Knowledge I'm giving you here today. Because if you don't begin to at least acknowledge that these gifts are at my disposal, and I don't mean that in a negative, because the very one who wrote concerning the spiritual gifts also wrote earnestly covet the best gift. How could he say these things? Because he's not trapped in how other people have tried to interpret his writing. He know exactly what he's writing. He didn't write that you've been given a gift. Some preacher told you that. Some book you read told you that. It wasn't the Holy Spirit telling you that. That's the knowledge of men. The Holy Spirit is with you to manifest all of this as you need. Okay. Yeshua, verse 25, Matthew. And Yeshua knew their thoughts. See, this is the word of knowledge. See, you can wonder what some, some people are thinking, or you can acquire the Almighty. The Almighty will tell you what people are thinking. You're sure when he asked his disciples, who do you say, who do men say that I am? Who do you say I am? He knew their thoughts. He knew the thoughts of his disciples. How did he know it? Because he was Yeshua. Well, he said, the things that I do, you shall do too. So what part of what Yeshua did can't you do? Only that which you limit yourself. See, you are the one who put limitations on you, and the limitations you put on you is based on the things you've been taught. On the YouTube page, Arthur Bailey, Apostle Arthur Bailey 1, you will find there's a, there's a video on taking the limitations off. You see, we only access a very small part of our mental capacity. Some people access more. Some people access little. People who don't like to read, don't access a whole lot of their mental capacity. You don't study, you'll always be limited to your theology. See, theology will limit you because theology is the study of God by men. And the study of God by men will be given to you as knowledge that will put limitations on your ability 
to think outside the box of that theological matrix. So you're operating within a mindset that theology put on you. When you allow the Holy Spirit to operate in you, then the limitations come off. All things all of a sudden become possible. See, for many of us, all things aren't possible. You say they are, but your actions show you they are not. Because listen to yourself, I can't. They ain't going to let me do that. I can't do that. See, You put the limitations on you while confessing with your mouth all things are possible to them that believe. The fact that you aren't doing all the things that you think are possible is because you have limited your belief. And it is not your doing. Religion did that to you. Preachers did that to you. Denominations did that to you. Books and sermons did that to you. And many of us have limited ourselves to the things somebody has taught us. And when we are challenged to think for ourselves, we have mental blocks. So we have to inquire. The people went to the prophet to inquire of the prophet so that the prophet could go to Jehovah and inquire on behalf of the people and now you have been given the ability to prophesy, which means that you can go to Jehovah yourself. But how many of us do it? Instead, we seek the counsel of the pastor. And, and let me tell you something, there's nothing wrong with that because there's safety in the multitude of counsel. But if the father has told you to do something, if he has given you instructions, do I need the counsel of somebody to follow the instructions that I know have come from the Almighty? I was thinking, you know, as I was meditating on this and as we get into faith, man, I better get a move on. Ooh. Um, some people wonder what people are thinking. The gift of knowledge allows us to know what people are thinking. The gift of knowledge will allow you to know what people are thinking. See, Yeshua perceived their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking. How did he know? The Spirit. See, when he was baptized, the Holy Yeshua was spilled, filled with the Spirit. The Spirit showed him. The Spirit led him. The, the Spirit gave him the ability to perceive the thoughts of individuals when they were thinking in his midst. And he was able to perceive their thoughts. Just like you, you can perceive thoughts. But you won't if you don't think you can. See, the biggest challenge that we have is we don't think we can. And I'm here to say you can. Now you got to exercise it. That doesn't mean that you get into trying to control people's thoughts and mind control and all that craziness. That means that you learn how to get quiet with the Almighty. And that's what I, you know, when I tell people, listen, I don't want the noise. I don't need to look at TV, because all TV is going to tell me, and all the radio is going to tell me, and all the, the news media are going to tell me is stuff that they want me to know. Now I got a head full of knowledge that they put there. And I got all this noise in my head that is making it difficult for me to distinguish the voice of the Almighty, and I've subjected myself to all this noise. I always got stuff going on in my head. Music. News, television program, movie, conversations, all this stuff constantly playing, constantly playing, constantly playing. I need to get quiet. I need to allow him to speak to me. But that means in order for me to be able to distinguish his, his voice, I got to shut them other voices down. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me show you something. Can I show you something real quick? 
You ever been in a conversation where nobody's talking? It's awkward, isn't it? You feel like you got to say something, don't you? We don't like quiet. For some reason, quiet has become the enemy of people. So to sit and not speak is foreign to many. Unless we sleep or we're watching a movie and we're so in tune to what people are saying that we don't want anybody else talking. See, that's the way we need to be with Jehovah. Just like you in the movie house. Shh. That's the spirit right there. I'm telling you right there. That's the spirit you need is you need to say to the radio, shh. You need to say to TV, shh. You need to say to all those voices, shh. You need to get quiet and inquire of him and wait on him to speak and write down what he say and then get busy doing when he says do. That's another use of the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is where the Almighty will reveal his knowledge, his mind, to you. But it requires some quietness. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, it's like I cannot get in my vehicle and drive without the Almighty speaking to me. Just can't do it. I sit, and sometimes as I'm studying, it's like, you know what? My, my, my brain is just constantly going. Just constantly going. The thoughts that I'm, that I'm having and the things that I need to do and, and the things that I want to do and the things that he want me to do and trying to distinguish all of those things. And this is just inside my own head without all that noise. See, when your brain gets active, you'll realize you don't need all the noise. Because your brain is a, as some would say, a super computer. This brain, you got to understand, Adam's brain had the knowledge of Jehovah. He had the ability to name things that had never been named. To call things that had never been called to do things that had never been done. And Jehovah gave him that ability. And those of us, especially who have been born again, because there are people who have not been born again, and their brain, they use super, I mean supercomputers in the sense to where research and technology and the ability to create and to make The amount of information that they can put in a microchip the size of a pen, the head of a pen. Imagine the, the technology of containing that kind of information and to put that information at your fingertips. I, I think back as I get on my computer and I have access to the world's library to where when I was in elementary school, we had to have an encyclopedia. Pedia Britannica to have part of that information and that cost if you had a set of Encyclopedia Britannica in your home you were looking at almost you know two to three thousand dollars if you got the whole set now all you need is a smartphone or, or an a iPad or, or, or a computer a computer, a $300 computer, and the internet in some Wi-Fi environment, and you have access to the world's knowledge. There are dumb people on the planet because they choose to be dumb. That's a choice they made. You can go Google, you can Google anything. And everything you need to know about anything. As a matter of fact, 
with a little research and maybe about $29, you can run a report on everybody in this room. So you really don't need, I mean, if you really want to operate in a human level, you really don't need the spirit of knowledge to get the skinny on somebody. All you need to, to do is pay some, some, some firm out there to do a background check. And they'll tell you almost everything you want to know about anybody. I was fascinated. I get fascinated easy. In the last week, my 12-year-old son has gotten a visa and a MasterCard sent to our address. And I'm thinking to myself, how do these people know he live here? How does MasterCard know to send a, a, a MasterCard with Alpha Bailey's name to our house? How does Visa know this? How do they know that there is, a, out of the millions, billions of, air, of, of addresses on the planet, how is it that they send a 12-year-old a MasterCard and a Visa card with his name on it at my address and got it right? You see, every time you give somebody a little bit of information about you, there's a database. And all of the information about you is compiled into one place. And people who know how to access that information, and all they need is a little bit of information, and your entire life story comes up. They know your spending habits. They know everything about you. Facebook. All you need is, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Uh, what is the photo thing now? Instagram. It's all you need. Get a smartphone, get a computer. And all of a sudden, all of your information is open for business to the public to see. That's how vast knowledge is. But even with all of that knowledge, it still doesn't compare to the knowledge of Jehovah. Because here's what that knowledge can, see, the knowledge of the world can run diagrams. They can do analysis based on your past history. They don't see your future. Jehovah sees your end from your beginning. They got information on patterns that you've established, but Jehovah sees the end of the plan, and he's willing and will reveal that to you once you get into the relationship that he desires to have with you. So he knows what people are thinking. Let me start on faith real quick, and we'll pick up here. 1 Corinthians 12, 20, 12, 9, the gift to believe with extraordinary confidence in Yah's promises. To believe power and presence in order to honor Jehovah, to inspire others, to build up the Messianic community. Now, the, the book of Hebrews takes us into, into this whole hall of faith fame, if you would, as some would put it, to where the men of faith and all of these, if you'll notice, all of these individuals that the book of Hebrews write about are Old Testament figures. Think about that. These individuals in the Old Testament who operated in supernatural faith. The word in the Greek is pistis. From 3982, persuasion, credence, moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher especially reliance upon Messiah for salvation, abstract constancy, and such profession by extensive the system of religious gospel truth itself. Assurance, belief, believe, faith, fidelity. The Hebrew root, and this is from a fellow by the name of Jeff Benner, the Hebrew root, aman, means firm, something that is supported 
or secure. This word is used in Isaiah 22, 23 for a nail that is fastened to a secure place. Derived from this root is the word immune, meaning a craftsman. A craftsman is one who is firm and secure in his talent. Also derived from Amman in the word immunah, meaning firmness, something or someone that is firm in their actions. When the Hebrew word immunah is translated as faith, misconceptions of its meaning occur. Faith is usually perceived as a knowing, while the Hebrew immunah is a firm action. And so, to have faith in Elohim is not knowing that he exists or knowing that he will act. Rather, it is that the one with Imanah will act with firmness toward his will. And this is from the ancient Hebrew word meaning faith, Imanah by Jeff Denner. Now, when we look at this area of faith and we look at Hebrews, what we'll find is that when it comes down to the action, faith as an action, that means that now you are trusting, you've heard, again, here's where prophecy comes in. Because faith in his word is where we are to be, which means that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Jehovah. When we put faith in people is because people have said something to us that have caused us to respond in belief. The way a person becomes labeled as a liar is that they've said things that we believed and they did not follow through on what they said, which means they are no longer believable. Thus, they are a liar and you can't trust what they say. Jehovah tells us in Paul's writings that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Jehovah. Those in the Old Testament that is outlined in the book of Hebrews heard from Jehovah and responded to what they heard. The reason I'm standing here right now, the very reason that I'm here in Charlotte after spending most of my life in Michigan is because I heard and acted. Thus, here I am, standing before you, teaching and sharing the things that he's giving me to share with you. We're going to pick this up a little next week and take it on from there. And hopefully in the next two weeks we'll conclude it. But here's what um, I want you all to really get from, from the teaching today. When it comes down to understanding and dealing with the spirit ram, your, your lack of knowledge that there are supernatural things going on all the time in your life will cause you to not be in lockstep with the Almighty who is spirit. Jehovah is trying to get you to where he want you, which means that sometimes he's got to get you away from where you are. Now, there are people that he put in our lives that are to help us along this journey. And we need to recognize who those people are. You see, the disciples were simply fishermen until Yeshua came along. Yeshua transformed fishermen into disciples, into apostles. They were simple fishermen. Fishermen who were out catching fish 
given a new skill to be fishers of men through the connection of being called by Messiah. There were other disciples who were being discipled by Pharisees and, and Sadducees and different rabbis whose instructions conflicted with the instructions of the Almighty given through Yeshua. The people who had discernment was able to recognize the true gospel, the true word of Yehovah when they heard it. Yeshua's disciples were in the midst of so many others who had disciples. John had disciples. Different Pharisees, both in the Sadducee and the Pharisee communities, had disciples. And yet, Yeshua's disciples, imagine this, teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples. So before John, the voice crying out in the wilderness, all the people had was the religious systems that were there until John came along. John comes along and announced that there's someone else coming. And at that particular point, these individuals who had simply been at the feet or mercy of the religious systems now is given knowledge and information that ultimately begins to turn the world upside down all the way to this present moment that we're in right now. Faith requires action. And the question is, what are you going to do with the knowledge, the information that you're receiving? You need to be aware, ladies and gentlemen, that we are in a spirit realm even while we're walking in a natural realm. And though you may not see yourself as a target, the fact that you are here, the fact that you are submitting yourself to know the things of Jehovah make you a high priority target. And the enemy is going to do everything within his power to get you away from here. Everything he can. Father, In John chapter 17, as Yeshua was coming to the end of his ministry, he prayed a specific prayer for his disciples and for those who would believe on their, on their teachings, their testimony, on the words that he had spoken to them. And the idea is that he knew that as the Belief was, if you smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. He knew that he was coming to a place to where he was, his time here on earth was, was coming to an end. And he prayed specifically for his disciples because he knew that what he had come to do was going to be fulfilled in them. And so they would need strength. They would need protection. They would need covering. They would need to be able to fight the good fight, to resist the onslaught of the enemy so that they would not be plucked out of 
his hand. And I want to just read a part of this prayer in, my, in closing. He says in verse 4, I've esteemed them, I've esteemed thee on the earth, I've finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, Father, honor thou me with thine own self, with the majesty which I had with thee before the world was. I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me. And they have kept thy word. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them, which thou have given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are, are mine, and I am esteemed in them. And now, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures, scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them or shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me, into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for those alone or these alone, but for them who also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the honor which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my majesty which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the prayer that Yeshua prayed for his disciples prior to, to having to endure what he endured. And this is a prayer that he's praying for us. The Bible says that 
Even now, he's interceding on the right hand of the Almighty. The Holy Spirit is praying on our behalf when we pray in his spirit. And my prayer is that you too, just as I, because we're all in this together, that we would serve him and do what he is calling us to do and even as he's prayed for our protection. Because right now, I know that the world is trying to pull at you, pulling at me, to get me to go in my flesh and to respond in my flesh, when the bottom line is that he has not called us to walk by sight or in the flesh, but to be led by his spirit so that we don't fulfill the desires of the flesh. It's easy to move in the flesh. It takes work. It takes discipline. To allow the Holy Spirit to have his work in us. Because for you to allow the Holy Spirit to have his work in you, that means you have to work against you. You have to work against you. And that work is to resist and to deny self in whatever capacity that is contrary to the will of Father. Father, I pray for all of us, knowing how the tempter comes to tempt all of us. And yet, we know that there is no temptation that can come at us that you've not seen and have already made the way out. Help us to be in tune with you at all times. Help us to surrender and submit. And even as Yeshua said, anyone who follow him must first deny themselves, pick up their stake, and follow daily. Help us to be that person who will deny self when self conflicts with your will. When our desire is opposed to the desire that you have for us, Help us to release and relinquish and resist our own desire that we might do your will. Father, I pray that you make us all sensitive, that even as you desire to give us your wisdom, knowing that the wisdom of you, the beginning, the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Help us to understand. Help us to have the knowledge. Give us that knowledge. Give us that wisdom that comes from you. Even as James said, if any of us lack it, let us ask you because you're willing to give it. Give your wisdom to us. Help us to attain the knowledge. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Make us in tune with your spirit so that the gifts, the manifestation, the giftings of your spirit will manifest in us. Help us to understand what it means to operate in wisdom and knowledge and faith. Help us to be in tune, to be aware, to be knowledgeable that we do have an enemy and it's not flesh and blood. To know that there are things that are pulling at us, distractions trying to keep us from seeing and hearing what you're saying and doing. And I just, I just pray for my brothers. I pray for my sisters. I pray for me. And I'm asking you to help us. To help us. We need your help. When I think about the fact that you said, except the days ahead be shortened, it's not comforting. But what is comforting is know that if we seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, we know that if, 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 if we are in you and you are in us, then nothing coming will distract or get us off course or hinder us or come between us or destroy the love that you have for us. Nothing, nothing. Help us to be in tune. Help us to be always mindful of your presence, to be knowledgeable, that you are here with us and to acknowledge that every day, every moment of the day. I pray your hedge of protection around every person, around every household, 
And I'm asking you today to, to bless your people. You know every need in this place. You know the things that cause us to vacillate, to go back and forward, to want to trust you. But then we see things that hinder our faith and hinder our trust in you because of the needs that we have. I'm asking you to meet every one of those needs. I'm asking you to show yourself mighty and greatly in every area of need that your people have. Father, you know the needs that we have before we even ask. And I'm asking you to meet those needs as you said you would. For you meet all of our needs according to your riches in glory in Messiah Yeshua. I'm asking that you would help your people, help all of us, relinquish our own reins over our lives to you that you will guide us, that you will direct us, that you will lead us, and that we will trust you totally, thoroughly. Even as Job said in his worst moment, though you slay me, yet will we trust you. Though you slay me, yet will we trust you. And I thank you for that kind of trust, for that kind of faith. No matter what we see with our eyes, no matter what Words come to our ears, no matter what the prognosticators and the, the, the media, the, the doom and gloom prophets want to speak and those who want to perpetuate fear in the earth. Help us to remain focused on you and your voice to be in tune. Father, I thank you and I bless you and we surrender to you. We ask that you continue to have your way in us. Be glorified in us. Glorify yourself through us. In Yeshua's name. Amen. I will, I will uh, pronounce his blessing upon you. Matter of fact, let me do that now. Yivarekakai Yehovah Vaish yeah, Yehovah Panavileka, be connected. Yes, Yehovah Panavileka, the same Lecha, Shalom. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to give you an opportunity to give of, of your tithe, of your offerings. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. This program is made possible through financial contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.